get started. Welcome everybody to uh, the Viola Bernard Grand Rounds today. Um, before I speak about Dr. Toth, our Viola Ber Bernard Grand Rounds speaker, I'd like to provide a little background on Dr. Bernard. Dr. Bernard was a prominent New York psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who was on the faculty at Columbia for five decades. Throughout her professional life, she worked to widen the applications of psychoanalytic theory to study and tackle social problems that she saw as negatively impacting mental health. She founded the Division of Community and Social Psychiatry at Columbia, and she directed it from 1956 to 1969. She was also a founder of what's now the Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. She was committed to understanding the needs and problems of children who are suffering due to poverty and other social and community factors. Along with that came a commitment to increasing access to mental health care for children and families living in underserved or disadvantaged communities. She established the country's first low cost psychoanalytic clinic at Columbia as part of her campaign to make mental health services much more widely available. In 2016, the Viola W. Bernard Foundation made a generous gift to establish the Viola Bernard Endowment Fund, which supports a yearly Grand Rounds presentation, as well as other trainings and evidence-based treatments for children and families. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Toth as our Grand Rounds speaker today, as you'll hear her work and embodies the mission of Dr. Bernard. Dr. Toth is Executive Director of the Mount Hope Family Center, Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry at the University of Rochester, as well as Director of Clinical Training in Psychology at the University. She graduated from Allegheny College and received her PhD in clinical psychology at Case Western Reserve University. She then joined the faculty of University of Rochester Medical School and, and the Department of Psychology. So she's been a, a lifer at her institution as, as I am here. Um, Dr. Toth's research interests are guided by a developmental psychopathology perspective, looking at factors that influence development, such as psychosocial adversity. Specifically, her work is focused on the impact of child maltreatment on child development, as well as the impact of the parent-child relationship when marked by the presence of a depressed caregiver. In addition to studying childhood responses to adversity, Dr. Toth has also studied the uh, effectiveness of interventions to address them. And I think that's where your work is so special that you've looked at both the risk factors as well as the interventions. She's received numerous grant awards for her research on the impact of adversity on child development, as well as for randomized clinical trials of preventive interventions and targeted interventions for maltreated children, offspring of mothers with major depression, and adolescent girls with depression and histories of maltreatment. Under Dr. Toast's leadership, Mount Hope Family Center, a very well-known place in psychology for training, uh, has become a site for rigorous and innovative empirical research with maltreated children and their families for nearly 40 years. Most recently, Dr. Toth was awarded a P50 capstone grant from the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development to establish the center as one of three national centers on child abuse and neglect. Dr. Toth's work has contributed significantly to our understanding of the impact of negative caregiving and trauma on development, as well as opportunities for successful prevention and intervention. She's published over 150 articles and received many awards for her research contributions, such as the SAMHSA Science and Service Award, among many others. I'm very excited to hear her talk today, titled, titled Child Maltreatment, Implications for Intervention. And with that, I will turn the Zoom over to you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much, Laura, for that lovely introduction. I am hopeful that my presentation can live up to all of those accolades. But it's, it's really exciting to be here today. I would love to be with all of you in person. We're hoping that could happen sometime in the future. But it's really an honor to be able to present at the Viola Bernard Grand Rounds. So thank you for the invitation. 
just to give you a bit of background of Mount Hope Family Center, um, our overall goal has really been to build strong families through science through scientific research. The center was established in 1979 as a center to prevent child abuse and neglect with a focus in traumatic experiences that particularly low income children and families have. The focus of today's presentation, I'm going to briefly give an overview of the deleterious effects of child maltreatment, which I'm sure most of you in the audience are very familiar with. I'm then going to talk about um, two primary uh, projects of research that I've been involved in. The first is a multi-component preventive intervention for young mothers from low-income families. And uh, the second is an intervention that we provided with adolescent girls, again, low in, from low-income environments with and without histories of maltreatment. And when I talk about the adolescent work, I'm going to begin by talking about two of our baseline studies, and then I will move into talking about our actual first intervention outcome study. And then um, as time permits, I'd like to discuss some of the new initiatives that we have ongoing at Mount Hope Family Center. So with respect to child maltreatment, we know that approximately almost 700,000 children are victims of some form of maltreatment in the United States, with many more instances going unreported. Particularly during the pandemic, those of us who work in the area of child abuse and neglect have become even more concerned because of the social isolation that families are experiencing, the increased stressors, particularly for low-income families, and the fact that these children are not being out in child care center centers or school environments where child abuse and neglect could be detected. We know that um, a lot of empirical support exists for the risk of heightened maltreatment perpetration among parents with a history of child maltreatment. And the work that I'm presenting today really highlights that. I think both of the populations that I'm going to be talking about today have experienced significant adversity, not only in childhood, but moving into their adolescent and then into their adult years. We know that child maltreatment is related with a myriad of psychopathological outcomes. Um, we know that exposure to child maltreatment increases the risk for a greater lifetime prevalence of many disorders, including um, externalizing disorders, disruptive and anti-social um, behaviors, mood and anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, personality disorders, and dissociative and psychotic disorders. And I think that highlights one of the principles of developmental psychopathology, which talks about multifinality, that you can have the same risk factor that really results in a range of different negative outcomes. And I think that's one of the challenges that we faced in the area of child abuse and neglect when we try to ascertain which interventions are most effective for these very vulnerable children and families. The first um, program that I'm going to be talking about is called Building Healthy Children. And it was actually coined from work that Frederick Douglass had done. Frederick Douglass was here in Rochester, New York, and he said that it was easier to build healthy children than to, break, than to fix broken men. So that's where we derived the title of um, our program from. It's really a unique program because it did not receive federal funding, but rather it was a community-based initiative where the Department of Human Services and um, the United Way of Greater Rochester decided that they really wanted to put some resources into primary prevention. So they issued um, a request for proposals that we applied for. And um, we basically focused on teen pregnancies, um, young women who had their first child prior to the age of 21, because we know that teen pregnancies are often associated with poverty, health risks for both mom and baby, and lack of education and school dropout for the mother. And teen births account for about 11% of all births worldwide, but 23% of the overall burden of disease, according to the World Health Association. So basically, um, we target mothers who had their first child prior to the age of 21, who were residing in poverty. They were recruited through pediatric practices here in Rochester, New York, 
we began recruiting through the University of Rochester Medical Center, but it became really clear to us that there was a much greater need community-wide. So we really expanded our recruitment strategy to pediatric practices throughout the Rochester community. Right now, we're located in about 12 pediatric practices. Um, our criteria for recruitment were that the mothers did not have any CPS involvement and that they had Child Protective Services involvement and that they had no more than two children. And it was interesting because our funders thought that this would be a very low risk population. And they basically said to us, you know, is that really something that you want to focus preventive efforts on? And we said, well, actually, we don't think it's going to be that low risk of a population, but we want to start with um, a population that is not so at risk that the probability of really being able to effectively prevent future child maltreatment is going to be an uphill battle. Um, our participants really underscore the fact that we were very right on with respect to the high risk nature of the population. In our BHC moms, about 85% have a history of trauma sometime in their lifetime. 65% of them had histories of child maltreatment and 30% of them had a history of sexual abuse. There also was a very high rate of um, interparental violence in this population. So starting with really a non-treatment seeking group of young mothers, you can see the incredible risks that they were facing and the incredible odds that it would be for them to really raise healthy children in a positive environment with a positive mother-child relationship. So the goals and objectives of the program were to reduce child maltreatment and out-of-home placement, to promote positive relationships between parents and their young children, to foster positive socio-emotional well-being for the mothers and their young children, and to support the physical health and development of the children. Basically, we, um, we enrolled children, typically they were around five months of old, five months of age when we enrolled them. Um, and we actually, as we went on with the program, we downward extended the age of admission. And actually right now we're starting prenatally enrolling moms even before they give birth to their children. And we're, we're kind of looking at how effective that is starting that early on. But our services in the Building Healthy Children program are conceptualized as a tiered pyramid. It's a multi-component intervention, which um, those of you who are interested, I can certainly talk more later about the challenges of a multi-component intervention when it comes to analyzing outcomes for your program. But all of the mothers in the program received the bottom of the pyramid, which is paraprofessional outreach. So we had community health workers who were demographically similar to the mothers that we were working with. They often resided in very similar neighborhoods. We're dealing with the same levels of community violence and trauma in the communities. The second part of the pyramid is parents as teachers. And it's really more of a um, parent skills training program that we really tried to have all of the mothers involved in as well. The next two levels of the pyramid are more specialized to the needs that the mothers were presenting with. Child parent psychotherapy, which is an attachment theory informed model of intervention that many of you may be aware of, uh, began many years ago with uh, the work of Selma Freiberg, who talked about therapy in the kitchen. And in more recent years, Alicia Lieberman and Patricia Van Horn have done amazing jobs, really focusing on having the model be very trauma informed, focusing on promoting positive attachment relationships and recognizing the effects of early caregiving experiences and how they're brought into the current relationship between a mom and her baby. Um, at the top of the pyramid, and I know Laura is particularly interested in this, we had interpersonal psychotherapy for our mothers who had, um, who presented with depression. All of the models are intervention based, and 
we really struggled with, you know, with this very high risk group of moms and babies. We didn't not want to provide anything. So our comparison group received annual screening and they were referred to other community based services. As you can imagine, engagement was really critical for this non treatment seeking group of very young moms. Um, the paraprofessional outreach workers were critical to really reaching out to the families. Again, as I mentioned, they were demographically similar. So I think there was more of a receptivity and not as much of a distrust for being involved in a prevention program that ultimately focused on mental health. Our community health workers assisted families with really meeting basic needs. Um, they would take them to ch child care appointments. They would help ensure that there was adequate food in the homes. They would try to ensure stable housing for these families that were often very transitory. And a big focus was also working to help these young mothers achieve educational attainment and those of whom were able to be in the workforce to um, gain gainful employment. It was a randomized control trial, and I think it was very innovative of our funders that they not only wanted to support the provision of services, but they really wanted to see whether it actually worked. So they didn't only fund the service, they also provided support for the research component of it. Um, our sample size for the research component was about 232 mothers. We saw them at three time points, pre-intervention, when children were 24 months of age and post intervention. And um, in the BHC condition, the active treatment condition, about 56% were in that condition and the screening and referral condition, we had about 43% of participants. We had a, an array of measures as we typically do with our work here at Mount Hope Family Center. We typically give way too many measures, but those of interest for the presentation today, we were looking at depression, we were looking at maternal self-efficacy, parenting stress, and avoidance of child protective services involvement. Um, with respect to child outcomes, these were very young children, obviously. So we were looking at well child visits with a pediatrician by age two, and in the preschool years, looking at um, possible mental, mental health symptoms that the children had. Um, when you look at our baseline data, comparisons of mothers assigned to the treatment condition and mothers assigned to the control condition revealed no differences between the groups at baseline. Mothers were on average 19 years old and the babies were on average five months old. The majority of these participants were um, black, mothers and they were single parents. And I would love to talk a bit more about um, the systemic racism that also has contributed to the trauma that these young mothers have faced certainly in the last year and, and certainly historically, I think that's become even more critical for us to recognize um, both as researchers and as providers of services. Uh, our results show that mothers assigned to the building healthy children condition reported less depressive symptoms at mid intervention, which in turn led to a cascade of positivity for the family, including less parenting stress, less child internalizing and externalizing symptoms, and greater parenting self efficacy. This was really interesting, I think, because it was really the impact on the maternal depression that resulted in some of the downstream positive effects that we were finding. And I have tried so hard to advocate both locally and nationally that when we're dealing with low income populations, young mothers, it's so critical that we screen for depression so that we can do proactive outreach and reach these mothers, address their depressive symptoms, and then positively have an impact on their parenting. We also saw some interesting physical health outcomes with children in the Building Healthy Children program having completed all of their preventive well child checkups by age two at a statistically higher rate than those in the comparison condition. And children in the Building Healthy Children program 
also completed a lead screening at two years old at a significantly higher rate than those in the comparison condition. Um, with respect to CPS um, avoidance of, of child protective services involvement, we conducted additional analyses with a subset of families for whom we had access to Department of Human Services Child Protective Services records. That's a long story that I can tell any of you who are trying to access Child Protective Service records about. We had great access to records for about two decades. And then when there was a change in administration, we lost access to the records. We've been working with the Office of Child and Family Services for about six years now to regain access to those records for a number of um, projects that we have ongoing. It's, it's been challenging. I'm remaining optimistic, but it's so critical to really be able to look at the outcome of these preventive interventions. With respect to indicated maltreatment, we saw that um, in our Building Healthy Children program, just um, over 3% uh, of the Building Healthy Children families uh, had Child Protective Services reports where over 10% of the comparison families did. And remember, those were families that didn't receive nothing. They also received screening and referral for services. So I think that's really noteworthy as well. So the take home message, I believe, is that a flexible evidence-based therapeutic support combined with community health workers dealing with concrete needs can improve family functioning and reduce the risk for child maltreatment a young, among young socioeconomically disadvantaged mothers and their children. I'm really excited to be able to report that we also have a long-term follow-up of the res results of this program. One of my graduate students, Liz Demusey, recently completed her dissertation and um, her goal was to follow up the families who had completed the intervention and to follow the children into the school age years. So it was uh, about a three to a six year longitudinal follow-up. I must admit when she told me she wanted to do this for her dissertation, I was a little skeptical because I thought the probability of us really being able to recruit a significant number of these families would be very challenging. Um, Liz was absolutely amazing. Um, she contacted all mothers via phone. We actually reached 56% of them who agreed to take part in the follow-up. Uh, visits were scheduled at Mount Hope Family Center. And um, we did look at attrition among completers versus non-completers of the intervention and there were no significant, no significant differences. So the target children for the follow-up were six to 10 years of age by the follow-up visit. And it was about three to seven years post-intervention. So what we found was in middle childhood, mothers in the building healthy children condition reported less harsh and inconsistent parenting and less psychological aggression with their children. And um, children in the BHC condition also evidenced, and this was again via maternal report, evidenced less externalizing symptoms, less emotion dysregulation, and they showed marginally significantly better executive functioning. Um, it was really great. We also had teacher outcome on these children. So the teachers weren't aware that these children had participated in an intervention. And what we found was that the teachers viewed children who were in the building healthy children condition to have less externalizing behaviors and marginally significant better behavioral and emotional regulation. This has recently been published in a special issue of development and psychopathology that honored um, the legacy of Edward Ziegler. So anybody who's interested, I believe that's available online at this point. Um, if it isn't, I could certainly share um, copies with anyone who's interested. Okay, so turning from that early preventive intervention, I now want to talk a bit about our adolescent depression work. The um, bo body of this work was a randomized control trial of interpersonal psychotherapy for depressed adolescent girls with and without histories of child, child maltreatment. 
And the design of the study was we just kind of wondered if interpersonal psychotherapy for adolescents would work differently if we had girls with a history of trauma versus girls without a history of trauma. I have to give a huge shout out to Laura Mufson for being the developer of interpersonal psychotherapy for adolescents. Um, she just has done an amazing job. We have found it to be an absolutely incredible intervention that works really well, given the time limited nature of it, given the modifications for adolescents with the downward extension from adults. And um, so basically we recruited 230 low income, racially and ethnically diverse depressed adolescent girls. They were 13 to 15 years of age and their caregivers. And as I said, many of them really probably about half by design had a history of maltreatment. They were all, all non-treatment seeking girls and they were recruited through primary care and community settings. And I keep mentioning the non-treatment seeking because when you see the risk factors of these young mothers and these adolescent girls who did not receive mental health services, were not seeking mental health services, and you see some of the incredibly adverse outcomes for these populations, it just so highlights for me the criticality of us doing more screening in basic um, pediatric clinics, um, community settings to really reach these populations that otherwise would not receive any services. Uh, the mean age of these teen girls was 14, about 66% were African American, 79% lived in single parent households, and the mean family income was less than $28,000. 51% had a history of maltreatment. As I said, that was by design. And this was a highly traumatized sample. Um, our girls reported experiencing rape, stabbing, house fires, family murders, gang violence, et cetera. Initially, and this speaks a bit to some of our na naivete, I think, we uh, did not want comorbidity in this sample, so we didn't want conduct disorders. We really wanted to focus on depression. And we learned very early on that if we ruled out comorbidity of anxiety and um, antisocial disorders, that we would pretty much not have a sample given the incredible high risk. So we had to modify uh, those criteria. The adolescents were randomly assigned to 14 sessions of interpersonal psychotherapy for adolescents or an enhanced community standard. We obviously didn't want to give nothing to these very high risk girls. So we had um, a therapist who was not trained on any evidence-based models who provided a general counseling model with the girls. And we tried to um, equate for length of time in treatment. Uh, we did a lot of outreach, as you can imagine, with this population, and um, a not insignificant amount of the work occurred in homes or in community settings where the girls were more likely to feel comfortable and um, not feel as stigmatized as they might going into a, a mental health setting. So I want to talk about two of our baseline settings, which I baseline studies, which I think are interesting. The first was looking at the intergenerational transmission of child maltreatment. And we know that there's a lot of evidence for the intergenerational transmission of maltreatment, but the mechanisms of why this occurs are not as well understood. Um, children exposed to parental interpartner, intimate partner violence may be threatened or injured during the conflict and IPV can really lead to parental rejection. And although studies have looked at the co-occurrence of maltreatment and parental IPV, the processes are not well understood. And the aim of this study by one of my graduate students who is just graduating this month, Tangria Adams, uh, was to understand whether maternal intimate partner violence mediates the intergenerational continuity of child maltreatment. So the results indicated that maternal intimate partner violence as measured by mother's report of their current victimization and perpetration of intimate partner violence mediates the effect of maternal child maltreatment on adolescents experience of maltreatment. 
In addition, the results show the emergence of this pattern in the next generation, with adolescent maltreatment being related to involvement in adolescent dating violence. And thus, the results show that involvement in IPV may be a key mechanism of the intergenerational transmission of child maltreatment. So the conclusion of Tangria's work was that a mother's maltreatment history can directly predict her adolescent's daughter maltreatment victimization. A mother's own child maltreatment history predicted her experience of violence in her adult romantic relationships. Maternal IPV involvement mediated the intergenerational transmission of child maltreatment. And the results show the emergence of this pattern in the next generation with adolescent maltreatment being related to involvement in adolescent dating violence. The second baseline study was um, led by one of my colleagues, Elizabeth Handley, and she was looking at child maltreatment and adolescent suicide ideation. We know that individuals who experience child maltreatment are at heightened risk for suicidal ideation, but really little is known about the specific interpersonal processes especially family, familial processes that may underlie the association between child maltreatment and youth risk for suicide. So the aim of this study was to investigate the mother-daughter relationship processes that underlie the effect of child maltreatment on adolescent suicidal ideation among depressed at-risk girls. This again was published in 2018. And if it's not out there easily, I'm happy to share it to anyone who's interested. So this table basically gives the rates of current suicidal ideation among depressed girls with and without each subtype of maltreatment. It's important to note that many of the girls experienced more than one form of maltreatment. Uh, so you can see with sexual abuse, um, about 42% of the girls with maltreatment um, versus 15% without sexual abuse had suicidal ideation. You can just go right down the line here, physical abuse, 25% versus 16%, physical neglect, 34% versus 15%, emotional neglect, 41% versus 15%, emotional abuse, 34% versus 11%. Um, so, you know, I think it's important also to, you know, to see these differences with the risk for suicidal ideation in this population if they did have maltreatment versus if they didn't. And it's also important to note that the majority of these girls had multi subtypes of maltreatment with, I believe, um, over 55% of the maltreated teens reported two or more subtypes of maltreatment. The results indicate that over and above depressive symptoms, mother-daughter conflict via mother report and mother-daughter relationship quality via adolescent report were significant mediators of the effect of child maltreatment on suicide ideation. And again, just thinking about the, the importance of these results given this non-treatment seeking population that had not been identified, the majority of these teen girls who had suicidal ideation, some of whom had, had suicide attempts, had not told this to anyone until they met with our research and, and our clinical staff. So that's really um, very, very frightening, I think, to think about this huge part of our young teens and our low income, particularly young teens of color who were not receiving adequate outreach services. So just to conclude, um, child maltreatment was associated with poorer mother-daughter relationship quality and increased mother-daughter conflict, both of which were linked with higher levels of suicide ideation among the adolescents. And we believe that we advanced the extant literature by identifying two distinct familial processes that partially explain why maltreated children are at risk of developing suicide ideation in adolescents. And this to me leads into the final study that I'm going to talk about, which is why I believe relationship-based interventions represent theoretically salient approaches to depression treatment for maltreated youth. 
So this turns to our um, first published study of our outcomes of interpersonal psychotherapy for depressed adolescents. Um, as I think probably all of you in the audience know, IPTA is a targeted intervention for mood disorders. It's time limited, it's empirically supported. Um, it builds on interpersonal theory and psychosocial research on depression. And it really makes a practical link between the patient's mood and disturbing life events that either trigger or follow from the onset of the mood disorder. And as I mentioned, Laura did some amazing modifications to this model to really be very relevant to the adolescent population. We also tweaked it a bit for our population. Um, we found that if we labeled this as treatment for depression, the girls were much less likely to want to enroll in the intervention. We really talked a lot more about um, the stressors in their life, how adolescence in period can be very stressful. And so we minimized the, the disease label of the model and um, really just did a lot of work around trying to make it relevant to what was going on in the teens' lives, you know, interpersonal conflict, role transitions, um, certainly um, some of them even, you know, teen pregnancy. So there was just a lot going on in this population. So we looked at the efficacy of IPTA among depressed adolescents with and without a history of child maltreatment. And that's been published in um, 2020. So for our results, given the non-treatment seeking nature of the sample, we used what I think is becoming a more common statistical approach for um, particularly interventions with non-treatment seeking populations, but we utilized something called complier average causal effect or case modeling, as opposed to intent to treat analyses, because with a non-treatment seeking population, you can find a pretty high non-compliance rate. So if you're really just doing your intent to treat analyses and you have maybe 40 to 50% of the participants who didn't receive any intervention, it's pretty hard to show that you have any results. So we did use case modeling. It's a pretty complicated statistical analysis, which I honestly would need to phone a friend if any of you have major questions about it, but she would be happy to share more about the nuts and bolts of the analyses. Um, but what we found was um, the results showed that the effect of IPTA compared to the enhanced community standard on change in depressive symptoms from, from pre to post intervention depended on whether or not the adolescents had experienced maltreatment. Among girls with a history of maltreatment, IPTA predicted a greater decrease in depressive symptoms at post-intervention compared to the enhanced community standard. And as the number of maltreatment subtypes increased, the advantage of IPTA over the community standard became even more pronounced. And among girls without a maltreatment history, the enhanced community standard and interpersonal psychotherapy for adolescents did not differ in their efficacy of decreasing depressive symptoms. So I thought that was a really fascinating outcome that we, you know, we really didn't anticipate. We maybe had an inkling because that's why we wanted the maltreatment versus the non-maltreatment population. Um, so, um, there also we found an interesting focus on sexual abuse, where our results indicated that the effect of IPTA compared to the community standard on change in depressive symptoms from pre to post intervention depended on whether or not the adolescents had a sexual abuse history. And among girls with a sexual abuse history, there were no differences in the efficacy or with among girls with a, without a sexual abuse history, there were no differences in the efficacy of IPT versus the community standard at reducing depressive symptoms. But among girls with a history of sexual abuse, IPT predicted a greater decrease in depressive symptoms compared to the community standard. So to conclude, these results suggest that interpersonal psychotherapy for adolescents, a relationship-based intervention, 
may be particularly well suited for individuals with a history of maltreatment. I think, although Laura could, could correct me if I'm wrong, I think this was one of the first studies to look specifically at IPTA for adolescents with maltreatment histories. And I know that Laura is um, engaging in some which sounds like fascinating work now looking at PTSD with adolescents. And I'll just be fascinated to talk more with you about that and to compare what you're finding with what we're finding. Um, I know there's been some work done with the adult population that I believe um, John Markowitz did, again, finding that IPT was effective for trauma. But really, I think we're kind of cutting edge here with Laura's work and John's work and our work looking at the importance of interpersonal psychotherapy for populations with histories of trauma. Um, I think our findings, like most um, intervention outcome studies, unfortunately, also highlight the importance of further exploring moderators of treatment. And I think, again, not to sound like a broken record, but our results really demonstrate the criticality of expanding services outside of the clinic walls and highlight the need for routine mental health screening in primary care settings. So those are my uh, kind of my intervention findings. And what I'd like to do now is just spend a few minutes talking about some of our current and future directions at Mount Hope Family Center. Um, I believe we're in our third year of a project um, Laura mentioned in her introduction. We received funding from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development to establish us as one of three academic partnerships in the United States to um, be a capstone center on child abuse and neglect. The other two centers are located at Penn State and Washington University in St. Louis. A really exciting part of this work is we're really trying to get the three centers to work together and um, really to ultimately develop more nationwide partnerships around this. But our particular um, project is called TRANSFORM, which stands for Translational Research that Adapts New Science for Maltreatment Prevention. Everyone tells me I'm great at coming up with these little uh, mnemonic things. So that was a bit of a stretch, but I thought TRANSFORM worked really well. Um, Mount Hope Family Center is working in collaboration with Minnesota's Institutional Institute for Translational Research in Children's Mental Health. And um, Dante Cicchetti and I are the um, PIs on this grant. As many of you may know, Dante was here at Mount Hope Family Center for I believe two decades. And since he went to the University of Minnesota, thankfully we've been able to continue our really decades long collaboration. So it's kind of been a win-win all around. Um, Transform basically has two main um, studies. So our research is focusing on two areas. The first that I'm working as the PI with Jody Todd Manley is looking at the efficacy of child parent psychotherapy, which we are delivering either prenatally or postnatally to impoverished families. And we're also looking at whether a shortened course of child parent psychotherapy is equally effective. So typically child parent psychotherapy is pretty long term. It's about a 12 month course of intervention. And we're looking at shortening that to six months. It's a really complicated um, design. <laughs> In retrospect, I wish we had kind of done one or the other, but we're, we're plugging away. The pandemic obviously has put a bit of a glitch in that work because for a while, all of our research, as I know yours was in New York, was shut down. Uh, we then had to move to remote intervention and we've been really very creative around um, doing Zoom interventions, telehealth, um, also uh, when the weather was nice, trying to meet families outside, um, figuring out ways to actually videotape parent-child interactions in the homes because that was a big part of what we were looking at, uh, looking at um, strange situation in terms of attachment security as an outcome. We missed a chunk of that. I've been 
very grateful that we're finding more recently that moms are willing to come into the center. And so we are, um, we are getting some of our strange situations again. And we've also come up with other ways of trying to look at the mother-child attachment relationship without knowing that we're going to have um, the strange situation on all of the populations. So we've been doing the parent development interview. Um, we've been doing some attachment scripts that um, I believe the, the Everett Waters group has developed that, that they graciously shared with us. So again, I think all of us during this period have had to be very creative in our approaches to both our research and our intervention. Uh, the second study, and these are basically two R01 equivalent studies. The second is a long-term follow-up investigation of a large-scale study of risk and resilience in school-aged children. And these were kids who attended one of our summer camp programs, not one of them, they attended like probably 15 of them. So it's a very large sample. We have over a thousand children who participated in this. And we're looking at the long-term effects of early trauma that these children experienced during the school age years where we have an array of different psychological and psychophysiological measures. And we're looking at the long-term effects. These kids are now in early adulthood. Um, so we're looking at the chronic stress of child maltreatment in relation to possible premature aging and current physical and mental health problems in adulthood. And the lead investigators on that are Dante Chiquetti, Liz Handley, and unfortunately, my dear friend and colleague, Fred Rogosh, who passed away in November, but whose um, contribution certainly will, will continue on into the future. Another big core of the TRANSFORM is called the Community Engagement Core. And that's being led by um, my colleague, Kate Cerulli, who's a JD PhD. Kate actually, as we speak, is doing a policy fellowship at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So she brings an incredible policy lens to the work that we're doing. And one of our real goals of Transform is to take what we know and what we certainly have decades of research, both, both basic research and more intervention research on maltreated populations. And we're trying to translate that into different arenas so that it really has more of an impact. We get it out of the academic realm and into real world settings where um, child welfare leaders, educators, practitioners, mental health providers, attorneys, judges, et cetera, can benefit from it. Um, I thought we had, uh, do we have a website here or no? We do have a website. If it didn't show up, I can show that website. I can share that website, but we have a whole transform website that has all of our archived um, webinars and a lot of information that's relevant for parents, judges, caretakers, et cetera. So I think that might be um, really helpful for me to be able to share with everyone. Um, so let's see where we are here. So with that, I just would like to acknowledge our funders, um, my amazing colleagues, Kate Cerulli, Dante Cicchetti, Liz Handley, Jody Todd Manley, Fred Rogosh, Melissa Sturge Apple, innumerable research assistants, therapists, students, children, and families. Um, I know it's trite, but I always say that doing work like this certainly does take a village. And um, those of you who are involved in this work know that it's, um, challenging. I think the last before our current um, promise study, that's the, the preventive intervention with, with moms and their babies. I swore I wasn't going to do any more intervention research <laughs> because it, it is very challenging. And um, But I think the, the value of it and the importance for society more broadly makes it worthwhile. So um, with that, I think we can open it up to questions, if I'm correct, Laura? Yes, great. I just want to say that was just um, an amazing talk. And there's so many interesting things that you're doing that I would love to <clears throat> hear more about. I think um, before I, I go to some of the questions, one of the things that I think struck me so much is 
the fact that um, these are non-treatment seeking, you know, moms and adolescents and the rates of suicidality that you're finding and the rates of maltreatment, um, as you said, really begs us to think about, you know, we're not picking, these are not folks that are going to show up in our outpatient hospital clinics. And, <clears throat> you know, the U.S. Preventive Task Force years ago said that we should be screening for depression um, in, in primary care clinics as, as a standard. Um, but I wonder whether that will even be sufficient in picking up some of these uh, moms and teens who may not endorse those symptoms, but still really have other risk factors that would, um, you know, obviously suggest that they would benefit from services, both preventive um, and targeted intervention. And I wonder if you have other thoughts about you know, besides depression screening, are there other types of screenings? I know in our pediatric clinic, um, through a certain project, they were doing the ACEs as part of a screening in pediatrics. But do you have other thoughts about other types of screening, uh, not only in primary care, but other settings? You know, we do a lot of school-based work. Would that be a place to pick up some of these kids? I think the school-based work is critical. And I know our um, child and adolescent clinic here at University of Rochester has developed a number of uh, satellite clinics in schools, which I think is really critical. We even established a small satellite clinic here at Mount Hope, where we have some of the child and adolescent therapists from URMC based here. Well, when they were based here, once we get back here at the center. Um, so I think that's really critical. One of the real concerns I have, though, is not all of these populations even show up at primary care facilities or the kids are not consistently attending school. We think about the homeless population, um, the, the transitory nature, nature of this population. And that's a real concern for me because even it'd be a huge step to even do the screenings, Laura, that, that you and I are talking about. Um, and it's, it's amazed me over the years, the resistance that I have found to screening for depression in primary care settings with the, the typical response being, well, if we screen and we find it, right. what are we gonna do with it? <clears throat> and if there aren't enough providers out there, that, or, or if the parent doesn't have the right insurance or whatever, it's almost like not wanting to know because then you're responsible for doing something. But what if there's nothing that you really feel that you can do? So I think that's been a huge challenge that from, a, from more of a social policy perspective, I think we just need to really work on. Um, that's why I'm excited about our Transform grant with Kate's involvement and really looking at trying to reach some of those sectors of society that, you know, don't necessarily think the way we do about mental health. Yeah. I have more <laughs> questions, but I will take some. We have two. Um, from William Tucker, uh, by Bernard would have been pleased that a lecture in her honor consistently emphasized community outreach as the basis of both treatment and research. My question is, what training was provided to the paraprofessional outreach staff and what was the impact on their future careers if these were studied that resulted from their involvement in BHC? So the training of the outreach workers, we have a, a fabulous, our outreach workers for these programs actually were employees of the University of Rochester Medical Center. And one of my colleagues, um, Marty Sandler, has spent her profession working with training community health workers. She has a fabulous program called Baby Love. Um, and that's actually where we're recruiting from for our one of our transform studies that I mentioned. Um, so the outreach workers are incredible. They also receive really high level supervision um, from trained social workers. Uh, so I think that's a critical component. I think too often 
we are not providing adequate supervision um, to individuals that are doing this really difficult work and who are themselves being traumatized in the process of going out into the communities and, and hearing just the incredibly painful stories that these um, community individuals have experienced. And I think particularly with the pandemic and with what we've been seeing around systemic racism, um, as I mentioned, a high percentage of our participants are children and families of color. And I, I feel proud about that on one level because they are underrepresented in the child development research and particularly in the um, treatment outcome research. So there's often then a resistance to providers not wanting to provide the evidence-based models because they say it hasn't been tested with the clients that we serve. So that's one thing. The, the second part of your question was about the, the future of the community health workers. Yes, what was the impact on, on them if that was studied from their involvement, I guess? Did it impact how they proceeded with their careers? That's, that's a great question. We have not studied that, but I can say that we have really been encouraging our community health workers to get involved in different educational endeavors. We have a number who have been involved in doula training. We've been a number who have um, become certified um, breastfeeding coaches. And I just feel that that has been just to see how positively they feel about that has been really, really wonderful to see. Um, I think it's a shame that as academic institutions, often we do not encourage the further educational attainment of some of our staff who, you know, are more at the grassroots level. And I've been on a number of committees here at the U of R where we're really looking at that more closely and trying to figure out how we can really ensure that supervisors are aware of the importance of supporting our staff, our grassroots staff around getting additional training. Um, I've also in the last, we've been major involved in a lot of diversity, equity and inclusion efforts here over at say at least the last five years, but in the last year, we've really intensified that. And I've been having um, some consultants come into Mount Hope Family Center to specifically work with our staff of color who may not be in the master's level or the PhD level positions to try to develop pipelines to leadership, um, which I think is just so critical, both for them as individuals, but also for us as a profession, um, thinking about the paucity of supervisors of color and uh, particularly the work that we do at Mount Hope, the majority of our population involves staff of color. So I am so trying to increase the diversity of our staff. So because we, we know, and I think there's increasing research out there that some individuals of color do not feel comfortable sharing their life stories with someone who's very different from them. One of my former grad students, Natalie Court, um, worked at URMC for a while, and she actually worked on an IPT study. Um, Nancy Talbot, you may be familiar with the work that she did. Yeah. So what Natalie did was at the end of the study, she we found that the, the women of color with depression did not benefit as much as the white participants. And all of the therapists were white. And so Natalie went and interviewed the women of color. It was a qualitative study. And to the person, they basically said they really liked their therapist. They thought that the therapist really cared about them, but that they really didn't think that the therapist could handle what they had to really share about the trauma of their experiences. And so they were almost trying to protect the therapist. And that was... Uh, that was very eye-opening to think about that, I think. So uh, we just need to do a lot better than we're doing in that area, in, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think those are great points. And 
interesting something I've been thinking about because I have a, a, with a colleague an R34 <clears throat> targeting um, using IPTA for black adolescents with a specific engagement intervention for black teens, but there, we're using school-based health clinicians, but the reality is 90% of those school-based health clinicians are white. Right. And so thinking about how that's impacting on recruitment and engagement above and beyond any of the interventions, I think is uh, been something that I've been thinking about. And, and that's a pipeline problem um, that we have and, and need to, to address. And, and what you're doing sounds terrific in that end. Absolutely. And I think a big part of our success with recruitment for our studies was the utilization of the community health workers that we really tried to help them understand why the intervention piece was important so that they could really translate that to the women that they were working with and help build some trust around that. A really neat thing that, that I've seen that's a bit I didn't really talk about, but you know, we, we typically have two arms. We have an active intervention arm and then we have a, more of a, a comparison arm. What we have found is that our participants who are involved often only in the research arm talk eloquently about how beneficial that was for them and how just being involved in the research has helped them to think about their babies differently, to look at behaviors differently. And they have felt so connected with even the researchers that you would think that some of the researchers actually were providing intervention for the families. So, you know, often I think we kind of get dinged for, oh, you know, you're, you're researchers and do you really care about the population? And what about the population that isn't receiving services? But I really can say that over decades, I have consistently heard from our research participants that they feel that they have benefited from their involvement in the research. Yeah, no, I, I think there's something therapeutic about some of the assessments and having that contact and knowing you're being followed and somebody's cares um, mm -hmm. even, even through the assessments. So I, I've, I've heard similar things in some of our studies. Um, let me see, there's another question. Um, you mentioned that the mother-child relationship quality and conflict mediates between child maltreatment and suicidality. There are, <clears throat> are multiple components in a parent-child relationship. Did you conduct any analysis on what specific aspects of the relationship are important? Do you plan to do this in the future? And what role does the father or second caregiver play in any of this? Those are, those are two fabulous questions. No, we did not do analyses on those specific aspects of the relationship. That would be a great future direction. Um, your point about fathers is right on. And we are trying more and more to get fathers involved, both in the research and in the intervention piece. Child parent psychotherapy really does have the flexibility to involve alternate caregivers. So we, we typically do do that. But um, we actually, on one of our transform studies, the preventive intervention, we've been doing more and more developing community advisory boards where we're really trying to have input from the lived experiences of individuals who either have been part of research in the past, part of one of our programs. And we just had a great group with a father whose mother was involved in child parent psychotherapy. And, you know, well, in the research piece up front, because in the research piece, we just focus on the moms. And he basically very eloquently said that he almost didn't want his partner to be involved in the research because it made him feel very dissed, very minimized, as if his perspective and input wasn't important. And we did then involve him in the intervention piece, but I think we were missing an opportunity right up front in that research piece to get the fathers involved so that we, and, and so we're also doing more um, 
prenatal child parent psychotherapy, which very much advocates for the criticality of involving fathers. So I think that's a great direction. But we've even heard from um, mothers and fathers that we work with that when they go to a prenatal visit, the dads feel like they don't really have a role or you know their input really doesn't matter. And when you think about the importance of trying to foster you know a positive familial relationship having that dad feel excluded right from the outset whether it be from a research visit or from a medical visit is a huge miss so i i think you know we 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 personally i'll speak for us need to get a heck of a lot better at that and hopefully there's more of a movement nationwide to do that because I think we're really missing an important window of opportunity. We just got a little bit of pilot funding. And one of the first things we're going to do is to try to involve dads in the research component of our, um, our transform preventive intervention study. Great. Um, I guess in thinking about the prenatal work you're doing, another question is, is there outreach to OBGYN MDs to make referrals to your, to your work? Huge, definite outreach. We actually met with the head of OBGYN here who was wonderful. Believe it or not, she's the first female head of OBGYN in the history of the University of Rochester Medical Center. Wow. When I walked into her office, there was this whole line of male chair photos, and then there was her. And I, I just couldn't help but comment. And, and I said, wow, here you are. And she was like, and you can be sure I'm not going to be the last. But uh, a huge part of prenatal um, child parent psychotherapy is working with the OBGYNs, because we also know that when these mothers have had trauma, histories that that birth and delivery process can be, you know, re-traumatizing for them. And we've been working with Alicia Lieberman a lot on this. And she told a, a really compelling example about um, a mother and, and their therapists. I don't know that we've gotten there yet, but their therapists, when they can actually try to be in the delivery room wow. when the mother's giving birth. And the therapist was in the room with a mother with a history of trauma who was giving delivery and obviously was struggling and the, her partner was there and he became very agitated because he thought that they were being abusive to his partner. And it was so important for the therapist to be there to try to help him understand what was going on, to try to help the medical providers understand what was going on, to really avert what could have been a really awful experience for, for the mom and, and the baby's dad. That's, that's really interesting. To think about bringing, <clears throat> bringing the therapist into the, into the delivery room. Well, and it's it's easier for Alicia because they're like really co-located out there where, you know, we're not co-located, but our therapists have really been doing a lot with trying to talk with the moms about their experience with the medical provider when moms agree reaching out to the medical providers. And um, in terms of our recruitment, we've been getting great responses from the OBGYN clinics in the area. That's great. Um, I'll ask another of my own questions. In the IPTA study, obviously, I'm, I'm so interested in that, given the work that we're starting to do with uh, Shane Ragbeer, who's uh, trained yes. by you and fantastic clinician and faculty member. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, because you chose the teens were, were eligible based on the depression, what did they get diagnoses of PTSD? Did they have subthreshold uh, levels of trauma? They, what we did was um, BDI and we also did the um, diagnostic interview. So, so it was a twofold thing. There, there was comorbidity all over the place, Laura. I don't have those statistics, but the PTSD rates were really high. I mean, you know, given the experiences that those young girls had and, and were still having even while they were, you know, in, in our intervention. Um, it, it was really, really 
horrific to to hear of the trauma that they experienced and um the other thing that that so i could i could look at that and get you the, those data on the comorbidity but there's a lot there was a there, more comorbid, comorbidity than not yeah. um which was why as i mentioned we couldn't use all those exclusion criteria that we wanted to early on um yeah, I'm, I mean, I think you you do have the first study of, of using this uh, with a population where the trauma is so documented. I think, you know, other depressed teens probably had some trauma in their background, but we didn't systematically document it and, and have the ability to look at it the way you did. And I'm wondering um, whether any other modifications were made in the treatment in terms of uh, parent or caregiver involvement that that's part of the adolescent model did that change i guess could potentially change depending upon whether the parent is the perpetrator of the right. maltreatment and you know how that impacted on on the delivery we struggled with that a lot up front in terms of thinking about how much parental involvement to have versus not have. And we really ended up, I think, reaching out to the parents, but really working with the teen around that and, and really doing it more on a case by case basis. Um, certainly would try to do minimally the educational piece with the parent about what the teen was struggling with dealing with depression, trying to help them understand that they needed to be more understanding around some of the symptoms, not, not viewing it as willful um, disobedience or anything on the part of the adolescent, but really a function of the depression that they were struggling with. But it, it really did vary. And, you know, with all of our work in maltreatment, it varies in terms of the parent's willingness to be involved or not. Um, we do a lot of work with trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, and Tony Manorino really wants parents involved with that and to be involved with the trauma narrative, and we try to do that, but there are some parents that it would be more destructive to have them be there to try to help the child with that trauma narrative than not, and so in those cases, we really look to identify an alternate positive adult that the child feels comfortable with that we can really help the child work through that trauma narrative with. Um, one more of my own questions. Um, I'm, I'm glad you have questions. <laughs> I have so many. I'm also really interested in um, <clears throat> the fact that you re you you adapted the concept of using the medical model of depression as an illness um, and used it more as um, life stressors. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering, because um, we just had a case I was supervising where um, it's one of the first times where an adolescent felt negatively about being told they had a depression illness. Huh. And I'm wondering, um, beginning to wonder whether as we treat kids more diverse from more diverse communities, whether part of the stigma of having an illness actually makes sticking with that medical model problematic for some uh, communities and your reconceptualization of thinking about it as life stress, although changes the IPT framework from saying you have an illness and using that to take the blame off the the patient and putting it on the illness it's not something wrong with you you have an illness like other medical illnesses for some groups that's not really satisfying and and still has a sense of stigma and shame that negatively impacts on the treatment in some way I, I was very aware that we would not be embraced by the IPT community for this, but it was very clear to us very early on that if we led right off with that label of a medical illness, we were not going to get people enrolled. And we actually did it both with our building, building healthy children, um, teen moms in the IPT arm, 
and then also with our adolescent depression work. And we didn't abandon it all together. Once the relationship was more formed and they trusted the therapist and they were, you know, on board with the treatment, we would then try to incorporate, you know, this isn't your fault. It is a medical illness. It is treatable. Um, Robin could talk a lot about that because she's worked so hard on that. Um, she's been a, a mainstay, Robin Sturm, of the work that we've done. She's just awesome. But she, um, we, we haven't abandoned it. We just don't lead right up front with yeah. it. <clears throat> and again, our population is largely um, populations of color that historically, I think, um, are somewhat really turned off by that medicalization and, and the sense that that having an illness is a blame, that if they were really good enough, that they could pull themselves up, that they could be the strong black woman. And so we, that's why we modified in that way. Uh, I think, <clears throat> I think that's really, really interesting to think about. Um, another question, were any of your mother's substance addicted? And if so, how did that influence your intervention? Good question. Um, if they were actively substance abusing, we would have to make a call on whether we thought that they were able to function enough to really be able to participate in the intervention. You know, certainly use of marijuana, um, that sort of thing would not be a rule out criteria. But if we had somebody who was on heroin or a major cocaine user, and we just didn't think that they, they really needed to deal with the substance abuse before they could really benefit from the intervention. So if it was low level, if they were in recovery, if they were even in treatment at the time that we wouldn't exclude them. Um, but to, to be super active substance abusing, I, I just don't think that we could be effective with the treatment model. And it, it also raises an interesting point you know, a lot of our studies we call efficacy studies, and then you talk about moving to effectiveness. I very much view our work as a hybrid model because we have really tried to be flexible enough so that it's not only going to work in a super controlled environment, and then you try to move it to more of a clinic setting or something, and people say, well, we can't do that because you did it with all these rule out criteria and everything else, and that's not that's not who walks in our door. So we, we really have done, I think, a blend between efficacy and effectiveness. Um, <clears throat> one more question. In England, there are always home visits. Is that possible or, or is it being done? I think you mentioned that some of your interventions were delivered at home. Can you talk a little bit more about, about that? Absolutely. The majority of our work is home and community based, um, particularly with the populations that we work with. I think that actually being in the environment that someone is residing in, being in the community, seeing the stressors that they're dealing with in the community. You know, we've had therapists in homes where they're hearing gunshots outside. And um, so I think that's really critical. I love the fact that other countries routinely do postnatal home visits. I think it's a tragedy that we're not doing that in this country, not just for very high risk populations, but for everybody, because I think every new mom is dealing with a transition and challenges and just that check-in would be wonderful. I We've had some, uh, some rumors here in Rochester about trying to implement some more prenatal or postnatal home visit more routinely. Um, I don't know how far along are, we are with that, but I have found that our home-based work is really critical to the engagement with the families, to them really believing that we understand what they're dealing with. You know, you can walk into a home where it's a one bedroom apartment and there are three adults and four kids and trying to do the work in that setting certainly is challenging but otherwise you're not going to do it 
And so I, I think that's critical. I know early on, I believe Alicia with her child parent psychotherapy work and Selma Freiberg, I think theirs was home-based. I think more recently over the years, Alicia's probably out of necessity doing in San Francisco, doing more clinic-based work, but we really have continued to try to do the home-based model. It's great. I mean, I, I think it's, it says a lot that they, they trust you to come into the home as well. And I wonder whether um, that, that varies by uh, ethnic and racial matching of the clinicians and as the same way in terms of engaging in the office treatment, whether that, that impacts the ability to you know, feel comfortable allowing people to come into your home. Yeah, I, I, it's a good question. It'd be a great empirical question. Um, you know, I know I've, I've heard clients say, you know, when I was assigned this white lady as my therapist, I thought, what in the heck is she going to know about me or anything about me? And then, you know, once I met with her a few times, I saw that she really did care and that she really did want to help me. So, you know, again, that doesn't minimize the criticality that we need more therapists and supervisors of color. Um, my, my grad student, Natalie Court, has, um, she's at William James College in Boston, and she started a whole mental health black leadership program, which I'm just so proud of her for. And um, I think that we need more models like that across the nation to really try to increase that pipeline. Great. Well, I think we're, we're out of time to give people a minute to transition to their next activity. I just wanna thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation. There are so many interesting studies that you're doing. I, I look forward to inviting you back to hear more about the transform work. Uh, and so thank you so much. I think this was uh, so consistent with Dr. Bernard's uh, goals for providing good care for underserved communities. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Laura. Thanks for everyone in the audience. And again, if I mentioned anything that you would like more info on, please feel free to reach out. Um, my email is uh, Sherry, S-H-E-R-E-E -E underscore Toth, T-O-T-H at U-R-M-C dot Rochester dot E-D-U. So would um, be happy to hear from anyone. So thank you and good luck with all of your continued work. Stay healthy. I know all of you in New York have been through hell. Um, so hopefully we're all on the other side now. So thanks for all you do. Yeah, thank you and be well. And I'll okay. be in touch.